everyone. Um, so a few more people need to turn on their camera. Stephanie, you don't have to worry about it right now. Um, so we left off with the Aztecs on Tuesday, and we were looking at the sun stone, right? The sun disk. And so when we were watching the video, um, we were focusing on that there is a number of different images. So this content of this stone. And when we look at it, it had a lot of parts to it. Remember that the interior section of it has a, like a, a deity, right? With his tongue stuck out. Kind of looks like a flint stone, right? Um, There we go. Sorry. Um, right, if you're having a hard time, you have to put it out because of the video. You can stay off if you need to. Um, so in the very center, we have this deity. And then outside of him, there's these four sections. And in the video, they mentioned it, that they were these four movements. Do you guys remember what those represent, these different movements? What's the whole reason why we have these four rectangular sections out of the deity. Who remembers? Anyone remember? Katie, do you Write that down in your note taker. I think it says the four previous suns. Right. So this is basically like the creation of the world. And so the Aztecs believe that the world um, was secular and it would start up again. So it would like we have an end and then a new beginning. And so this sun marks the fifth movement and it shows us that these different periods before how they were ended. So one was ended by Jaguar, one was ended by wind, one was rain of fire, one was water, right? And so that's in the central section of our sun disk. And then outside of it, we basically have representations of these symbols, but also we have kind of like days and months. And then we also have the compass. So there are, if I go back to this image, there are all of these things in the content of this, this stone, right? So it's a marker of time, right? But not just like a simple like clock, right? It's more like calendars as well as the creation and the resurgence of the world. Now, strangely enough, I don't remember seeing anything about where exactly this is from. Um, obviously, it's from the Temple of Mayor, but I don't, it doesn't really explain where it was found at the Temple of Mayor, so I apologize for that. I, I forgot to look that up this morning. That was on my list of things to do, and I did not do it. Okay, so, oh, here, we talked about this already, but why is there two temples at the top of Temple of Mayor? A little review. Why is there two temples? Why is there two temples? To worship two different gods. Worshiping two different gods, but remember that they're tied together. We can't have regeneration, which is to lap, right? It's like fertility, water, God. We can't have that without destruction. So the Whitley Poloche side with fire and warfare, you have to have things that end to bring back the prosperity. So these are two kind of unified ideas of creation and destruction. That is how the Aztecs gained their power. They also, um, you know, people from all over would come to um, to Tenochtitlan, to Temple Mayor, um, to worship. And so we have an Olmec mask. So this Olmec mask, made out of jadeite, um, was found in 
reserves at Temple Maya. So this was a offering to the God. So you can see how people from other areas um, would bring things to the temple, but also the Aztecs did not like erase people who kind of like came before them, right? They embraced it. So they, you know, they embraced Tenochtitlan, Teotihuacan, the Olmecs. That's part of their creation story as well. So this was an offering that was laid there with other things. You have obsidian, you have lots of jade, um, and then of course things like blood sacrifices as well. So the focus is impurity objects from previous generations. And it's possible they also would have worn it for different ceremonies to transform into other beings. So how is this characteristic of the Olmecs? What are some of the Olmec characteristics we can talk about um, by comparing this to like a colossal head? What are things that you would write down as characteristics? Aaron, can you give me one? a slightly unrealistic square head and bigger noses. Right. So they have kind of like this helmet hat, right, um, at the top. Um, let me see if I can get the speaker to be a little louder. Oh, it's as loud as it goes. I just had a hard time hearing you. So they often are wearing this sort of helmet. These uh, are very similar. There's probably um, some sort of helmet or crown that the ruler would make. Anything else similar between the mask and the colossal head? They tend to have like broad noses and thick lips, right? And they're pretty realistic looking, right? They're not overly geometric. They're not overly simplified. Okay. Questions on the full map map? Okay, the last piece that we have is, you can see a lot of the function and the content here, is a ruler feather headdress. Um, this was probably Montezuma the second um, headdress. Um, here's another example of a Aztec headdress. And so I wanted to show you a couple of them so that you can identify some of the common characteristics. So what are some of the characteristics that you see between these two feathered headdresses? Isabella, can you help me out? Give me one. Um, they both have like green tail feathers. Right. They have really long green feathers. And those green feathers um, could come from parrots or they can come from Quetzal. Quetzal, let me go to it, right? Quetzal are these little birds and they're actually really common in areas of southern Mexico and Guatemala. It's actually on the Guatemalan flag. My husband's Guatemalan, so I know that. Um, they have these really long, like they have two or three feathers at the very base of them. And so they will pluck those feathers, right, to make those headdresses. And so can you imagine how many birds had to lose their life in order to pluck those feathers, right? So they have long green feathers, right? They also have some smaller feathers around the headband that are a little harder to see. They are embellished with some gold Right? And they're woven. So can you see the part that comes closest to where your head would be? It's kind of woven like textile. And they'll often use things like gold, red, or blue to kind of contrast the green of the feathers. So what's the function, right? It is obviously a headdress, but a little bit more specifically is that the ruler, right? He wear this out in public. Right? He'd wear this for special ceremonies. He might be standing at the top of Temple Mayor or one of the other numbers of temples or, um, you know, ceremonial spots 
in the city. And he has to be able to be identified. Like you want to be able to see him. And so this recreation of an Aztec ruler, you can really see how it would be obvious that he is the ruler, right? Thinking about how big. You can go into the museum, like in Mexico City, and stand in front of one of these things to see how it's like almost like Vegas showgirl feathers on the head, right? And it's really big and dominant. So you would be able to identify the ruler from quite a distance. So just kind of like what we mentioned when we looked at the um, Hawaiians, right? They, the, these feathers were sacred. This was a common practice. And so they would have specific Nahuatl weavers who would weave these headdresses, but they also used feathers for other ceremonial objects as well. And it was something that um, in the Smart History article, they talk about that when the Spanish came and were Christianizing these people, a lot of Christian symbols were then decorated in a similar fashion. So they used the feathers from parrots and macaws and um, casals to decorate these Christian symbols. And we've talked about that since the beginning of Christianity, how they'll embrace things from other cultures, you know, characteristics of paganism, and give them new meaning. And they do the same thing in the new world. Okay. So that is um, basically Central America. Right? So we're going to move to another region. We're going to move to South America next. We're going to be looking at the Incas next. Okay. So the Incas ruled the largest empire of any indigenous people in the Americas. They had the largest territory, they had the largest population. And just to give you kind of a time reference, this is happening at the exact time the High Renaissance is happening in Rome. Right? So this gives you kind of a reference. This is one of the later um, groups of people, but it's also the largest. And so their territory stretched for about 3,000 miles on the uh, western coast of South America. And it was connected by a series of roads. And just like the Romans, right? I like to equate the Incas to the Romans. Um, they were able to trade goods and to move armies on their systems of roads. They also didn't really have a written language, but they were able to keep records. And so this strange looking thing up at the top had a series of like strings on it. That's actually a system of knots. And they had a whole coding system, kind of like Braille in a way, where you have like little knots that would denote uh, how much um, like commerce was moving back and forth. So some of these illustrations, you see the roads, you see suspension bridges. A lot of people who go on, you know, trips to like Machu Picchu today, hike these same ancient roads. Or I shouldn't say ancient, these older roads. They're not quite ancient, right? So the first thing we have for the Incas is actually a city plan, which I think is kind of funny. Um, the city plan of Cusco is kind of unique. Um, it's not quite a grid, um, but it's not quite the shape that we normally associate with the city. It actually is supposed to resemble an animal. Do I have any educated guesses about what animal Cusco is supposed to look like? I don't necessarily expect you to guess this. Any educated guesses? It's supposed to look like a puma. It's supposed to look like a cougar, right? Um, so it's supposed to be a cat. So remember in Chavin with the jaguar eyes, these large cats were really common in this area of South America, right? And so the city of Cusco um, has a ceremonial city, right? And that's basically the body 
of the, of, the, of the cat. And then the head is another image that we have, the Zetula Amen, um, is supposed to be the head of the cat. And so the boundaries of the city were based on a river, now it's kind of a street, right? Because Cusco is a much larger city now. And then the main plaza of the, of the like the ceremonial part of the city um, was where the heart of the animal would be. Um, one of the buildings that we're going to look at, the Porcajana, is where the genital of the animal would be, right? So kind of a fertile sort of symbol, right? And then the tail of it was at the base of two rivers. So let's go ahead and just learn a little bit about Cusco. A walk in the Puma city, city of Cusco. The historic city of Cusco is in Peru, situated 3,400 meters above sea level in the Andes Mountains. It was the capital of the Inca Empire before the Spanish conquest. The Baroque Cathedral in this square is one of the main gathering points. The Spaniards invaded the city in the early 16th century and destroyed all Incan palaces and temples. This altar is covered in gold used from Incan monuments. The Inca people worship nature, condors, pumas and snakes were guardian gods. The city has a puma shape. This part is the head and the heart is the central square. Remnants of the Inca Empire have been found. Sunstone walls still stand. This is Santo Domingo Convent. There used to be a temple dedicated to the sun here during the Inca period. It was regarded as the most sacred site in the city. These neatly arranged walls were decorated in gold. The glow represented sunshine. The Spaniards took the golden statues of the sun and removed golden leaf from the walls, but left the stone structure and built the church on top. This courtyard dates back to colonial times, but the water comes from a channel from the Inca period. This sacred hill is the head of the human shaped city. There are also stone walls here. The site is known as the Saxa Iwaman. It is believed to have had a religious purpose. The Inca army barricaded themselves inside during the war against the Spaniards. At Cusco, the mystery of a long lost ancient civilization remains in the air. So for you know, the contemporary traveler, Cusco is normally where people fly into if they're going to go to places like Machu Picchu. They'll normally go into the city that's at a very high elevation itself. Um, and so Cusco means the city of four quarters. So it is not only in the shape of a puma, but it also has made four, that's basically two main roads that divide it into four sections. And so you can see that Cusco is basically, even though it's at a high elevation, it's in the valley of um, a hill, you know, sort of mountains on the side. And so we're going to break it apart into the different uh, parts that are in your image set. So we're going to go first to that Santo Domingo convent. Um, the ancient building was the Puerto Chata, right? And so we have the curved walls of it. So the building on the top was built by the Spanish, right? 
what we're going to be focusing on that is in depth is that curved wall at the base and, and pretty much the interior. So the corpus, uh, excuse me, corpus chata, it means golden house or golden enclosure. And so the video mentioned its function. Does anyone remember who it's dedicated to? Who's it dedicated to? Little hint, it was covered in gold. So it would gleam bright yellow. Who's it dedicated to? Kalana, can you help me? I'm not sure, actually. Can anyone help her out? Is anyone it dedicated the to the sun god? Right. It was dedicated to I-N-T-I, -I, Niti, who is the sun god for the Incas. And so this was a shrine in the worship of the sun god. Um, it was a place where people would come to worship that god. And it was also a place that marked time. So there were windows in this older structure that would work like a calendar so that they could record the passage of time. And so the walls of the interior and the exterior were covered in, in gold leaf. And so they would use these series of windows to monitor that sun, um, to represent that sun god. And then it's kind of interesting, if you look at it, the shape of it is kind of similar to something we saw in Egyptian culture. Does it remind you of something? It reminds me of the mastaba that later became the pyramids, right? They've got those sloping walls, right? Notice it's not perpendicular to the ground. And so the shape of it recalls the, the rays of the sun, right? And so here's kind of a little like star map of the Incas that was done in gold, but you can see that this would have been the kind of uh, scenes that would be on the facade of this temple. And so the whole thing would be bright and gold. Now, you might think about um, gold being something that was super valuable. And honestly, it was to the Incas. But as we see, gold, even though it was plentiful for the Incas and they used it in decoration of this major temple, you know, kind of representing the sun god, it wasn't actually their most revered media. Believe it or not, they revered um, tapestry and weaving. That was their art, highest art form. So the, the Spaniards did see, the, obviously, the value of the gold, and they melted a lot of it down for decorations of churches, but also to bring it back to Spain, melt it down, make it into coins and things like that. Um, so a lot of the gold, the Inca gold, was taken from this territory. Right? So let's describe the stonework, right? What are some words you could use to describe the stonework used by the Inca? This is something that they're really known for, for their architecture. What are some words you could use to describe it? Eva, can you give me one? Um, it's laid out pretty smoothly. Right, it's very, very refined. And so the Incas have two different uh, styles of stonework. The one that we see here is the smooth surface wall. And so they would precisely cut stones that work with the, within each other. Um, they're not necessarily uniform, they're not necessarily the same size, but they were precisely cut to fit and interact with each of like with each other. And something unique about the Incas is that they did not use mortar, right? So why would they not use mortar? Mortar helps make a wall strong. Does anyone know why they chose not to use mortar? This is in a high region that was very common for things like earthquakes, right? And so earthquakes would make walls move. And so if we have things like mortar, it makes it stiff and they might fall and crumble. But if we have some give, right, we have room for the wall to kind of move and shift, it would settle back in place. So it actually was quite smart of the Incas not to use mortar in, their, in the region where they live. Um, in this structure, there's a series of these double frame doorways 
And this was really common in places of prestige. So structures that were important often had this double frame. And just keep in mind that they were covered in gold. Outside of the convent, they had mentioned that there was this courtyard. And the courtyard um, had about 4,000 priests who worked within the courtyard. So this was an entire ceremonial complex in the genitalia of this puma, right? And so one of the things that they did is they had a golden garden. So being that it's located, right, in this important section of the puma, there's an element of fertility, right? So having a garden in this fertile area makes sense, right? It shows the prosperity. It shows that they can serve and take care of their people. And so what did they have in the garden? They had a bunch of gold and silver pieces of artificial core they had made. And they also had little golden llamas. And you've probably seen things like that before. So they used uh, precious metals, gold and silver, to recreate a garden that would be there forever. Sorry. Lots of animations borrowed from someone else. Let's go ahead and look at that. So we have quite a unique piece in the 250. We have the silver and gold piece of cord, right? And so this was in a garden with those miniature llamas, also flowers. So they are all made out of metal and silver, and they were in this garden. And they were supposed to mimic the ripe ears of corn. Right? They were supposed to live, basically represent the fertility of the Inca. Now these things are not solid, right? They are basically hammered sheets of metal. So all of that decoration um, is like te like texture. So it's like hammered into the sheets so that it really recreates the sense of the husk of the corn and then the kernel. It would have been hammered probably from inside out. And so these were like, you know, hollow vessels, almost like an Easter egg, right? It's empty on the inside and kind of come together to form these ears of corn. Right? So these things were often, um, you know, representations of fertility. So they also were offerings to the sun god. And a lot of the imagery that was in this garden represented the whole territory of the Incas. So llamas lived in the mountains, right? And then of course was obviously in agricultural regions. And so they would try to have objects that represented all the territory in this garden. This idea that you have to have unification, this blending of all these people from all these different ecosystems to um, to basically work together for the common good. Right? So then we're gonna next go to the head. So this is the wall of the Sarskalama. So up in the hillside. There's a series of this architectural stonework. So these stoneworks are a little bit different. Instead of being the smooth surface walls, here we have these colossal, so like megalithic stoneworks that is in these irregular shapes. Now, honestly, sometimes the Incas did it with smooth stone, sometimes it was irregular. It didn't necessarily mean that one building was more prestigious than another. So I, want, I don't want you to think, oh, you know, the Pachana was smooth, so it must be more important. But it's very, very irregular. Some people theorize that it comes from some of the maze, right? This idea of this irregular shape comes from some of the ancient grains that the Incas raised. So some of the corn. Um, sometimes corn is not as regular. Right, this is pretty regular, this yellow one. But if we go to the next one over there, notice that some of the kernels are big and some of them are small, but they still kind of fit together. And some theorize that these represent some of those grain shapes as well. So what's the function, 
right? What's the function? In the video, they mentioned that at the very end of the eighth of power, they used it as kind of retreat and in protection, but that was not the main function of the Sashkuahana. Um, its name means falcon, right? So let's think about other sort of bird imagery that we've talked about before, like Lama Sioux, right? Or um, the eagle, right? In like the, the four um, fossil writers, right? Like John the eagle. What do birds often represent? What do birds represent? Where do they spend their time? Jasmine, what do you think? I think they represent like freedom because they spend most of their time in the skies. Right? They can represent freedom. They're spending their time in the skies. They also observe, don't they? And remember that this is, if I go back to the map, right? This is in the hills above the city. And so this could, in a way, like look over and kind of protect the city, right? But it doesn't necessarily mean that it was an arsenal or a citadel. It wasn't a place where the armies protected the city. In a way, it just kind of was on a height that overlooked and watched over the city. And so we see, right, a series of walls. But if we really kind of step back from it, we see large open spaces. What are large open spaces usually used for? Things like ceremonial sites where large populations of people can come together and be together, right? Um, the walls obviously feel fortress like. There's rooms in here that they could have used for storage. And so they could have stored uh, food resources here, ceremonial equipment. Um, obviously at the end, right, when the Spanish were coming in, that's where they would also hid armies and hid, you know, weapons and things like that. But at the beginning, right, it was probably more of a ceremonial spot than it was a fortress. Any questions on Cusco? Okay, so moving into probably what you guys are most familiar with is the city of Machu Picchu. So the Incas, we had mentioned before, they really transform their landscape. The Incas are really good at looking at their environment and transforming it for it to make sense. So in this very mountainous region, they would often create terraces. And these terraces have many functions to them. One, you can plant crops on these terraces. Um, so you could plant resources, you could plant you know, corn and grain or whatever you needed on these. But also, they were there for irrigation. So basically, we're in the hills, right? It's very steep. And so by creating these steps, they could protect the land so that it doesn't have like landslides. So they could put different kinds of topsoil here. So you would make it so that the water would seep into the earth rather than rush down the face of the hillside. So they built it up with stone. They had water channels and ways of collecting the fresh water for drinking as well. Um, we also, Remember that they created a series of roads. So here's an example of a road that switched back, back and forth so that you don't kill your legs walking up straight, right? And so you can see that they manicured the landscape for roads. They created bridges out of ropes that you can still use to cross rivers and gorges. And so it made it so that not only could people, but commerce could move around the empire. And so on one of these main roads is the city of Machu Picchu. So how does the city itself reflect its natural setting, right? How does the city reflect its natural city? Why do you think the ruler, right? I think it was like maybe the second or third Inca ruler 
created Machu Picchu. Why would he pick this location? What do you think? How does the city reflect its natural setting? Go ahead and take a second and write it in the chat for me. How do you think the city reflects its natural setting? Why did they pick it? the city, oops, sorry, when you look around the city, you can see that it's built kind of on a flat area next to the sacred mountain. And so it had these beautiful vistas. So when you're standing in Machu Picchu, you can see these really beautiful mountains. And there are several major mountains that were sacred to the Incas in this location. So they were able to observe these mountains from a distance. And also, these sacred, like they found stones, right? So this is a sacred rock at Machu Picchu and it's in the shape of the hills, right? So it really echoes the mountains that they see beyond it. So they would have thought this place would be sacred location. So they built into it. So this, right, estate, right? So this estate um, was created, like I mentioned, by one of the Inca rulers, so one of the Inca kings. Um, it was not his capital. Where would his capital be? Where do you think the Incas had their power? What's the other major city that we talked about for Incas? In the shape of a Pumas? Cusco. Cusco, right? So the ruler would have had his palace in Cusco. So this was more than likely a retreat. This would have been a ceremonial retreat. This would have been a religious retreat. Some people even say that this could have been like his summer estate. So a place that he would go to get away from the city. Um, when we look at the location in the hills and how many astrological observation areas are there, we would also have to mention that it's not just a place to enjoy yourself and get away from the city. It definitely was a ceremonial religious site. Right? So when we look at kind of a plan of this, it's all in Spanish. However, we can kind of get an idea of how it was divided up. It has a royal residence. It has ceremonial areas, right? So the ceremonial areas are really close to the royal residences of it. And then also the people who live there full time also lived within the city itself. So even though the ruler didn't live there all the time, there would be priests and people who obviously had to help with the function of a city. So we have, you know, farmers and masons and all these people who would have specific jobs to keep a thriving city going. And this was on one of those major trade routes, right? So here you can see how some of the houses were built. These kind of like irregular stonework with like peak roofs. They would have been thatched at the top. And then this is the royal district. So within this, we have the palace, but then also kind of hinting towards the function of the site. It had an observatory and then other ceremonial buildings. Right? So, it, at Machu Picchu, they had water. So, when they terraced the hills, they were able to channel and collect fresh drinking water. And there's a number of fountains there's, uh, and channels that would help bring fresh water to the people who live there. Um, one of the major ones, the major fountains, is in that sacred district in the precinct where the palace would be. And then in this setting, right, we have some of that irregular stonework, right? 
So the first building that we have is the observatory. Why would the observatory be in the Royal District? Why would you have an observatory? When I talk about observatory, we probably shouldn't mention that we would be observing the sun, right? We'd be observing the sky, we'd be observing the stars, right? Why would that observatory be in a royal district? What could that symbolize? Or what could be the function of that? Cora, do you have any idea? Um, maybe because it's kind of like associated with the gods and the rulers want to be associated with the gods. Right. The ruler, right? The ruler would be connected with the gods. The ruler would be connected with the religion. So not only is he an administrator, he's connected with the functions of the entire empire. And of course, religion is going to be a major one. So them observing the sun, right, the supreme god would make sense. Right? So in the observatory, it has a curved wall and it has a series of openings or windows. And when you look through the windows, you can observe the winter solstice. If you look through another window, you can observe the um, summer solstice. So the construction of this, right, with those um, curved walls and those, this one has a little bit more regular stone to it. Um, these windows were strategically placed to notice the movement of the sun. Another thing you'll notice is that the floor is not smooth. Isn't that strange, right? What do you think this structure was placed on top of if this was not altered? What do you think? This was placed on top of some sort of sacred stone, right? If this wasn't sacred, they would have flattened it. They would have made a floor, right? They would have altered it in some sort of way. So the observatory is actually placed on a rock that has a cave underneath of it. So inside the slit here, there's a cave, right? So they, when they were thinking about where do we put the observatory, there's all these factors that come into play. They need a good location to observe the sun, but also they get this hint from the gods that this is a sacred location because there is a cave there, right? So remember that caves are often symbols of fertility, right? They're the womb of the earth. Um, next to the observatory, there is the stone. So outside in the, kind of like on one of the terraces, that we have the Inuki Tuatana stone, right? So see that it's the sun, right? Inuki is the sun god, right? So this stone is outside the observatory, right? And the stone, based on its name, what do you think its function of is? What is it used to record? This is a good photo. Look at those shadows. Like what time it is? The time, right? This is a marker of time. It's called the hitching post of the sun. And because it's located in the sacred district, its function was to, um, as a, like a sundial, right? It was a marker of time. So Machu Picchu, we have a royal residence. We have an observatory of the sun. We have it noticing its natural surrounding. And it's located in an area that observes these sacred mountains that were important in the um, religion. Okay, so I mentioned that the Spaniards stole a lot of gold. And of course, the Incas were probably pretty upset that they lost their gold. However, their most revered art form is textile, it is what they're known for best. And so the last image that we have for the Incas is this tunic, right? So this is a like a ceremonial um, robe. So this little slit that we have right here is somewhere that your head would go. So that little vertical slit would go with your head 
and then your arms would come out the sides here. So it's kind of like a poncho in a way. Now this one is quite unique. This one's quite unique because this one is a really important one that expresses a lot of power, right? Um, I forgot I had an exercise with this one. Um, there's some links on Canvas, but we'll skip through them because I didn't prepare it, so I apologize, right? So this tunic, right, is not, it's common in the area. So this is an Inca one, but this is worn by the Lima people who existed before this. So this kind of geometric patterning of textile was really common. What's unique about this one is that all of these little squares are basically symbols. And so people who had tunics made were typically uniform. So like see this middle one and this one on the right have, they're very much the same pattern all across here, right? Now this one over here is a ruler tunic, right? It's a ruler tunic. And I know it's a ruler because basically all of these little squares represent someone's position in Inca society, right? And so this one is worn by an administrator, right? The gold and black with those little squares and little diagonal lines. This would be made out, you know, made for an administrator. This one that looks like a checkerboard would be made for someone in the army. Somebody who rules over everyone would have symbols of all of these different people. Notice the checkerboard for the army right here, right? Um, notice the administrator right here, right? So this tells us that this was made for a ruler. So these kind of tunics were made normally on wall looms. So they would use a vertical loom in order to weave these patterns and they use natural dyed fabric. And they would also use camelid fibers. You guys remember our camelids? Camelids, right? So alpacas, llamas, other creatures that have fur, right? They use those to weave Right, they dye them and then they use them for their textile. So here's an idea of how something like this would have been worn. So they are very, you know, graphic. They're basically symbols, right? Very minimal in design. And that's very common for the Inca textile. So all of this is woven into the surface rather than painted. Okay. Questions on the Incas? Okay. Um, we are going to go ahead and get started. I don't think we're going to finish today, which is fine with me now that we don't have the pressure of having to be ready for May 5th. Um, so we're going to look at um, Northeast and Southeast Native Americans. So we're moving to North America. And we're actually, right now, we're going to go up into um, Canada and Alaska area. Um, so here, this, you can see the circle that's in the red. So we're doing the Pacific Northwest. So we're jumping a lot here. Right? And so we're going to move into one of my favorite pieces. Um, if you go to the Field Museum, they have several examples of these um, Kuakua maps. Right? And this is called a transformation map. So we have two images for this. We have a closed version and an open version. So you can see that it opens and closes and transforms from a raven to a human. Right? So of course I just explained the content. So what animals are represented? Right? So when we look at the animals, on the outside, we have either a raven or some sort of bird, right? It could be an eagle, it could be a hawk, um, it's stylized. When it opens, we have a stylized human, right? But also, if I look right here, see the brown? 
those circles, and then this part here. Does that remind you of any other animals that are common in the Pacific Northwest? I see that. It could be a bear. Yeah, I see that. And the brown eyes and then like the snout and the nose. So it could also have an abstraction of a bear. It also has a raven here. So the eye of the bear leads to a beak on the side. You see that on both sides of the left and the right of this, right? So describing the style, right? How would, what kind of words could we use to describe the style of the transformation mask? Is this realistic? Is it realistic? No, right? This is stylized, and this uses a kind of style that's very common in the Pacific Northwest, and we call this form line. So add this vocabulary to your transform, transformation map. Form line typically has a lot of ovoids. So ovoids are things like um, ellipses, right, or ovals. It kind of has a rounded sort of quality to them. It has things like U's and F shapes, right? So it's kind of curvy. It also has something that's very similar to what we saw in Chavi, right? It has kind of that sense of contour rivalry. And so what I mean by contour rivalry um, is remember that this is where things kind of merge together. It's almost like an optical illusion. We're not sure if it's a part of one object or another. So remember that we have kind of like that bear image on the inside. Notice that the eyes of the bear are also the eyes of a bird. You guys see the stylized bird on the side. So there's this kind of like merging of the imagery on this kind of harbor way up in the Pacific Northwest, very far from where we talked about it in South America. Okay. Um, let's look at. Let's go ahead and look at the function of this. These maps were used at a hot latch, a hot latch. And so we're going to watch a really short video about a hot latch here. More to be a chief. It was James Seaweed's role to give potlatches, share his wealth. Now, 63, he has become a great chief by giving more. A lifetime of struggle to pass on to the young a knowledge of their past. Long before the coming of the white man, the Kwakiutl people lived along the coastal waters of western Canada and Vancouver Island. Here they built a rich and virile culture, told in spectacular art and centered on the potlatch giveaway, for generosity brought honor to the giver. On great formal occasions, the chief gathered his wealth and invited guests from many villages. Through days of singing, dancing, and feasting, he lavished canoes, blankets, and other gifts on his guests according to rank. The more he gave, the greater his prestige. Prodded by missionaries, the Canadian government banned the potlatch in 1876. Illegal until 1951, the potlatch was held at a great risk.
gift of like fur, um, things like seal hides, things that the people would need, they would give them out at these potlatches. And so in the potlatches, they would often wear um, costumes, they would wear these kind of ceremonial attire. And so part of those costumes were these wooden masks, right? And so they would have a potlatch to share resources, but they also could do it to pass down knowledge from one generation to the next. Um, they could pass down um, religious significance, so like this idea that they needed to restore or heal after a harsh winter. Um, they could use it for initiation. Um, for people becoming part of society, men and women. So here you can kind of see um, the, how the masks, they're made out of wood and they were painted with bright colors. You can see how they're used with other sort of ceremonial attire made of natural um, things. So here we have raven imagery and you can see that the costume had a series of feathers. And so the animals that are represented on these wooden um, masks were ancestry spirits and they represented often family grouping. So different representations of your family could be representations of your clan. And so you guys are probably pretty um, knowledgeable of like totem poles, right? A totem pole is normally a series of different animal heads that represent different people of an area. So the major kinds of animals that are represented in these transformation maps are things like killer whales, right? Which are common to this area. Um, different kinds of birds like ravens, which are kind of like the tricksters. Um, they had wolves. Here, this one has a wolf on the outside. It's hard to see. Um, and then they had other things like eagles and so on. Right? So these each of these animals were part of the creation story for the people, but they also represented um, different family plans. So they created cycles of sun, moon, fire, salmon, and rain. So these are things that would be resources to the people. Right? So to get a transformation mask, you would hire an artisan to make one for you, and they would carve it out of wood and paint it with natural, natural paint. You can still go up to the Pacific Northwest and basically have one of these made. They, of course, have updated their material. They're still normally carved out of wood, but they normally use modern tools and modern paint to keep those nice, bright colors. But often they get kind of complex. Sometimes they have three openings so that they can transform. And so these things would be worn. And what I'll do is, let's see. Actually, the video I have is not very good because it's dark and it's a ceremony. Um, but basically what would happen is that they would wear these and they would dance and act like the animal that they were. So if they were a raven, they would take on like flying motions with their clothing, right? And these masks would open and close, and the Canadians outlawed these. So they mentioned in the video for almost 100 years, people could not openly have hat latches or um, could not use these transformation masks. And the reason is the Canadians thought the Quaquas were cannibals. And the reason is that they would basically bite, like, pretend to bite people as they were opening and closing these masks. So these, these animals would like bite participants or bite each other in the dance. And so they were outlawed. And then it wasn't like until the 50s that they were able to do them. Okay, so we will stop there. This is the chinklet blanket that also has that wood form that we just talked about. But it's not in the 250, so we'll skip it. I think there's a postage stamp coming out with this kind of design. I think I just did saw. Okay, so go ahead and we didn't get to our activity. This is the activity I have planned for today. So we'll start it on Thursday. We have to wait a long time. That's okay.
Okay, I will see you guys later. Um, thank you for being patient. That was a lot of me talking today, so I apologize. Like I said, I had an activity plan, but we never got to it, so I'm sorry. See you guys later.